Good evening. It's not very often that a simple, humble doctor of medicine shares the podium with one of the most respected names in the financial industry. And for this incredible privilege, I would like to thank you, Governor Zeti. I'd like to thank Icliff, and of course, its mercurial CEO, Rajiv Peshawari. Usually, whenever I sit on a bar stool, I tend to fall off after about five minutes. So today, I think I will not sit. I'll probably lean, I'll probably stand, whatever. And Governor, I'm very sorry. I forgot to bring my mind map with me today. And I have also just done a complicated eight-hour quadruple bypass on a patient whose kidney and liver were also not functioning properly, unfortunately. But the good news is that he's doing very well, and I'm able to spend the evening in this very august company. My brief was quite similar to yours, Governor. It said, share your leadership story, what values you hold dear, and of course, a few tips on well-being and good health. So I'll start from the very beginning, in section 14 in Petaling Jam. My father used to work for Shaw Brothers, which at that time was a significant player in the movie industry. But he was not the star nor the actor. He was just the manager of the Lido and Federal Theatres, which Shaw had at that time. He was a very simple man. He was straighter than a straight line. And he was a very pious Hindu. But his best friend was Mr. Muhammad, a very pious Muslim. And may his soul rest in peace, but extremely proud of the fact that he came from the same village in the state of Kerala in India, which gave Malaysia our fourth prime minister. <laughs> Those days, I used to go to all of Uncle Muhammad's tahlils, and they used to come for all our pujas. Those were the days when there were no fancy slogans, no media hype, no fanfare, no metallic pins that you have to strip onto your collar or shirt pocket, but just good old-fashioned respect and affection for a fellow human being. And that's something that I hold very dear, even to this day, those lessons that I learned from my dad and Uncle Muhammad. And I think that's very important because, as Governor very rightly put it, the world is getting into a very complicated mess. And if we forget this genuine respect and affection for a fellow human being, I think we are in trouble. I then went on to do medicine at the Madras Medical College in India, which is the second oldest medical institution in India. And I was extremely fortunate to be part of its 150th batch. And there have been 28 batches since then. I came back, I did my housemanship in Malacca, and then was deciding what to do. I knew I needed to do a speciality, but I wasn't sure what. I decided not to take up gastroenterology because for the life of me, I couldn't imagine myself shoving sophisticated cameras up a certain part of a human anatomy, which for some amusing reason in Malaysia today has become a national obsession. <laughs> I didn't want to do anything with cancer, the big C, because I must confess that I realized very early that I did not have the mental courage and the fortitude to deal with this kind of suffering on a daily basis. You know, for every motivational, inspirational story that you see or hear of a cancer survivor, there are hundreds who struggle to cope with the disease. 
And unfortunately, as in the story of Lance Armstrong, even those who survive cheat. <laughs> so, you know, I, I didn't want to do that. So then what was left? There was heart surgery. And at that time, it just had that unique combination of a challenge, plus a little bit of glitz and glamour, which I kind of liked. And I must say that I was extremely fortunate that my five minutes of fame came when in 2007, I was selected to be part of the team that looked after Tun Mahathir. And uh, I know voting is just around the corner. <laughs> if there is even one individual in this room who thinks that age has caught up with the great man, I assure you it's not my fault. Please blame my anesthetist. <laughs> now, what are the values that I hold dear? Actually, by sheer coincidence, when I was reading an article many, many years ago, it was about Nelson Mandela, but he was talking about this African philosophy of Ubuntu. I'm sure some of you in this room have heard about the term Ubuntu. Ubuntu in English means I am because you are. And I think it signifies the essence of being human. It highlights the interdependence of human beings. And at one moment, Ubuntu can mean respect, it can mean trust, it can mean caring, it can mean sharing, it can mean unselfishness, it can mean the community. And very soon I realized that not coincidentally these were the very attributes of a good doctor. A good, a good doctor needs to be a listener. He needs to be empathetic. Patients don't like sympathy. He needs to be skilled, especially in a complicated environment like heart surgery or brain surgery or any other complicated field of medicine. And I think these are the things that we as leaders in our own little domain, nothing compared to the leadership capability and potential that most of you in this room are proud to be holding. But I need a small team in my daily uh, routine. I don't know whether uh, you understand, but when you go for a bypass operation, you probably need a team of about eight people to look after you. And the drama and the hype about heart surgery is that, number one, there is no room for error, and number two, the response time, in case you make an error, is only four minutes. In four minutes, you can get a substantial problem with the brain. In eight minutes, the damage is irreversible. So, looking after this eight people who do the bypass operation, I have to make sure that all eight of them are on top of their game. And unfortunately, if any one of them are not up to par on that day and something goes wrong, the blame will always still be mine. You go to any hospital for that matter, you won't know who was the nurse who looked after you or you won't remember the technician who did the thing. But if something goes wrong, they will always say, oh, Venus patient didn't do well. So that is something that I always tell the members of the team. I lean on them as much as they lean on me. And I think a lot of it is implicit trust because the technician who runs the heart-lung machine, for example, cannot even see the operation. And it is communication that really makes the operation go very smoothly. So all the characteristics or qualities 
that ICLEF and everybody else teaches you to be good leaders uh, in a small scale done on a daily basis in the cardiac operating theater. Now, what about some tips on good health? <laughs> the Dalai Lama is supposed to have said, man sacrifices his health to make money and then sacrifices that same money to recover his health. <laughs> he is so afraid of the future that he forgets to live in the present. And in doing so, he thinks he will live so that he will never die. And finally, he dies having never lived. <laughs> and that, I think, is very important. I'm not as eloquent as the Dalai Lama, but I tell all my patients, life is something you enjoy, not endure. I think there is a difference. And basically, I think in any health kind of education, there are three significant words. Common sense, moderation, and discipline. Because even if you look at the scientific literature, even for us doctors, it's very confusing because one day they'll tell you A, another day they'll tell you B. Take cholesterol, for example. I think everybody here in this room knows how to spell it, right? <laughs> for 20 years, they have blamed cholesterol as the root cause of all heart problems. But today, we know that that might not be true. And you need cholesterol. You need cholesterol because you need cholesterol to form cell membranes. You need cholesterol for brain activity. Maybe you get better brain maps with uh, cholesterol, <laughs> high cholesterol. You need cholesterol for neurotransmitters. So cholesterol is very important. And if you really follow the actual dictum and go as low as possible, it might not be the right thing. Number two, for years we've been told that having saturated food and food that is high in cholesterol will increase your cholesterol. But that again is not true because only 25% of the body cholesterol is from diet. 75% of the cholesterol is produced within the body. So you see scientific data is sometimes very confusing. You go to a doctor today, they will give you a list, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, this, that, all kinds of things. But now scientists believe that it is not the actual amount of the LDL that is important, but it is the number of LDL particles that's important. So, you know... <laughs> I mean, if you really sit down and try and analyze all this, you will go cuckoo. <laughs> but common sense, discipline, and moderation. I think these are the key words. All of you are probably in an environment where I think the most difficult thing that you deal with on a daily basis is stress. Stress to achieve deadlines, stress to enforce policies, stress to make the right decisions for the country. Now, don't underestimate stress. Stress has been known to initiate a whole lot of inflammatory body reactions, and these inflammatory body reactions have got a capacity to influence various organ function. Heart disease is sometimes thought to be of inflammatory origin. Strokes, all your arthritis and all the other autoimmune disease. So the thing is, you and I, we cannot go without stress. It's just how you handle the stress that is important. And I think, basically, you need to give time you need to give protected time for yourself. Spend 30 minutes a day alone 
in a closed room. Meditate. If those of you are not against yoga, do yoga, but skip the mantra. It doesn't matter, you know. I think the most important thing is meditation, spending time on yourself, reflection. All these will actually calm down your whole body system and help you to recharge. The other thing people say is cultivate a hobby, a hobby that you are passionate about and that is very important. Sometimes it can be gardening, it can be golf, it can be anything, but cultivate a hobby. Number three, listen to music. Music has been known to be extremely soothing and People say that if you can even learn to play a musical instrument. I have just started learning the piano. <laughs> Not that I'm very stressed, but in fact, ever since I left IJN, it's been a wonderful world out there because in IJN, I tell you, my day used to start at 6.30 in the morning. On a good day, you finish at 9 p.m. And you do two, maybe three bypasses a day or three heart operations a day. It was madness. But I am very, very happy to say that if there is one institution that I would like to go back to, that's Institute Jantan Nagara. I think amongst all the GLCs, uh, I think there has been a consistent level of achievement and I think it has contributed more than any other institution in the medical industry to our country. But now, I'm in Pantai, so <laughs> what, I, what I hope to achieve is bring the best of IJN into the private sector. And that is what a few of us, myself, that's a Dr. Zainal Hamid, who was the medical director of IJN, we have now set up this new Pantai Heart Institute, which is just celebrating its second anniversary today. And uh, I think it has been a wonderful journey setting it up and, uh, you know, serving the public in a different way. The other thing that a health tip, exercise. Exercise is a given. Again, you need protected time. Just running around the office, up, down, you know, saying I do 20 rounds, I walk from here to the canteen, I climb up the stairs, I don't take the lift. No, that's, that's not exercise. You need protected time. And, of course, there are various, various types of exercise that people do. The catchphrase these days is H-I-I-T. I don't know how many of you practice that. It's called High Intensity Intermittent Training. They believe that by really going full steam for a very short period of time is equivalent to, you know, doing your routine exercise. But again, I'm not sure, as I said, the scientific literature is very confusing. But I think if you can put in 45 minutes of brisk walking per day, I think is, is good enough. And that will keep you going. I don't know how many of you have heard about this project called the 10,000 Steps. And that 10,000 Steps is if you can walk 10,000 steps every day, I think it was initiated in Japan. It has been shown that there has been a significant decrease in very many disease entities. So I think, I don't want to take too much of your time. Adiba Noor wants to give us a few more songs. I like her music, I like her jokes. She hasn't said much jokes today, but anyway. I think if I may conclude, I would like to give you a hint of my favorite quote, and that is, every yesterday is but a dream, and every tomorrow is but a vision, but every today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Eclipse for this incredible opportunity.